so good to be in the house of the Lord today. So, do we have any first or second time visitors? Nope. Them. Yes. Yes. Well, welcome. Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Um, now you're forever embedded into the family. So even if you decide not to come again, you're going to be like the distant cousin. Um, so we have a pamphlet for you to fill out. Oh, so let's greet everybody <laughs> with our air fives and air hugs and, and depths and all of that. Amen. I ask you now to bow your heads as I usher us into the spirit of the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the men and women who serve our country and those in leadership roles and for their families. Give them peace when their work takes them away from their families. We also pray specifically for the wives, husbands, and children. I pray a prayer of healing for one of our members whose dad had open heart surgery. I thank you that you are Jehovah Rapha, our healer. I ask that you touch every vessel and vein in his body, dear Lord. I pray for the family and children of Earl Simmons. I pray that you comfort them during this difficult time. Heavenly Father, wrap your loving arms around them and give them a peace that passes all understanding. Peace that can only come from you, Lord. Peace that he's free from suffering and pain. For your word says, let everyone be subject to the authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God for a lack of guidance, a nation falls, but victory is won through many advisors. Thank you, Lord, for the advisors that you've given, her, given us. Thank you, Lord, for Chaplain Hughes, and I pray the word, we pray over the word that she's given us this morning. I pray that you set the atmosphere and bless the worship team as they bring you to fort. Ask all these things in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good afternoon, GS fam. Can we all please stand and read along with the, with the pamphlet? Today's responsive reading is going to be from 1 Chronicles 16, verses 23 through 25, and verse 31. Sing to the Lord, all the earth, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and he is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens, let the heavens be glad, and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Amen.
Good afternoon, family. So I'm here with your announcements. So if you turn to page two of your uh, pamphlet with me, uh, as you will see on Tuesdays, we have the men's and women's Bible study, both at 1830, both here at the chapel and on Facebook. On Thursdays, we have the officer fellowships at 1930. And then on Saturday mornings, we have the Bible interpretation class. Uh, also, we have opportunities to serve at the Titan Refuge. And uh, obviously, this is a high turnover base. So if you have a calling, please uh, see us about being a greeter, an usher, uh, perhaps preparing meals for our fellowships, a uh, musician or singer, as well as doing the, uh, the prayer or AV in the back. So please come see us. Thank you. Morning, GS fan. So we're doing tithe and offerings, as we know. Um, it's good to give in the house of the Lord. Be a cheerful giver, okay? Uh, we have the. Uh, if you see your bulletin, there's a Q code that you can scan, and that you can you can give through that. And then if you have cash, it's good too. So this month we are uh, like. Um, doing this offering to North Afri uh, American Mission Board. So every month we designate and we just give some offering out. So your money is going somewhere, okay? So can we pray? Father, we just want to thank you for the opportunity you give us to be able to give into your kingdom, to help others and to be able to lift up your glory. Father, we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
such a declaration, extremely difficult at times, but just to say you will trust, you will put your trust in the Lord. Sometimes, thank you, ma'am. I want to put somebody on blast, but I'm not. Sometimes just saying it, even if it's difficult, can remind you that you have the ability to do it because he is the Lord of Lord and the Kings of King, right? All right, family, we're just going to go ahead and jump into the text today. Uh, we're going to read from Exodus chapter 14. We're going to be begin in verse 10. And I'm going to actually read this passage in the New American Standard uh, Bible. And I ask those who are physically able to uh, stand with us, join together as we reverence the reading of God's word. And if you either have your Bible or a smart device, it will be on the screen for you. Amen. As Pharaoh drew near, the sons of Israel looked and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them and they became very frightened. So the sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. Someone say, never will you see them again forever. Just say that. Never will you see them again forever. That's the part that y'all going to shout on a little later. So the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. And I'm going to keep reading. As the... Uh, Keep, as for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea on dry land. As for me, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will be honored through Pharaoh and all of his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for speaking to us through your word. Decrease me while you increase. Prepare our hearts and our ears. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have your seat. It's good to see you all. You know, Friday is my favorite day of the week. I just like going home and pondering and talking to friends, right? But Sunday is my second favorite day of the week, and not because of what you think. Yes, I like to preach, and I like to be in the house of the Lord, but it's really because of you guys. Like, I love seeing your faces, so this has nothing to do with the service. I just want you all to know that you are some beautiful people, and I love you guys, okay? All right, so many of you all know that I love basketball. My first love, not because I was very good at it, Although I was very good at it, but that's not why it was my first love, okay? Basketball became my first love because of the connections with the adult men I had in my life. So stepdad, my biological father, uh, uncles. It was the connection that I made with the, the adult men in my life. It was also the leadership skills that I developed while on the court. I started playing organized basketball a little later than I think my parents should have put me in, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so it was about the sixth grade, but it was fun for many years. But the best basketball wasn't the organized middle school or club or even high school basketball. It was street ball. Is anybody here familiar with street ball? You know the difference between street ball and organized ball. Okay, there's some people that's not in your head. There's other people who don't. So street ball 
has no respecter of person. Street ball is where people did not care about your gender or your age. If you were able to play the game, then you could play the game. Street ball is where you had to call your own fouls. And even if they were valid, you would potentially be seen as weak if you continued to call too many of the fouls. Street ball is where you, your heart was developed, your, your character was challenged, and the passion of the game was brewed. I would tell you this, street ball was where people made a big deal about crossing over someone, breaking ankles other than scoring. So you could cross someone over and if you didn't score, nobody cared because everybody was focused on the person that just got crossed over, right? There were no passes giving in street ball. Either you could hoop or you couldn't. What I would say is there was a phrase or a couple phrases when you heard on the court where it highlighted that somebody had a disadvantage. So when you hear words like clear out, let them eat, or go to work, the defensive player would probably be embarrassed, but something would happen where their pride would try for them to uh, play defense more than what they could, right? But for the offensive player, that was affirmation. To hear your teammates on the court or people waiting to play on the court say, go to work, something in you clicked. And that meant you were extremely better than the person that was playing defense on you. It was affirmation. It was basically saying the person that is guarding you is no match for you one-on-one. -on -one. So we let these people go to work. I barely, I was rarely very, I rarely was given the chance to go to work because I played against a lot of guys, right? But what I would say is the team had trust in whoever had the ball at this moment to score, to dominate against their op opposer. However, it's so ironic that they sung the song, I will put my trust in you because at the end of the day, we can put our trust in somebody who time and time again scored over the, op the, oppose the opposing player. But sometimes it's very difficult for us to put our trust in the Lord who time and time again has brought us through. So today's word, if I had to tag a title to this text, it would be simple. It would just be watch God work. That's the admiration, the admonition that I have for you all today. Watch God work. Now, to give you a little background of what's happening in this text in Exodus 14, we have to go all the way back to Exodus 1. As a reminder, many of you guys are probably familiar with this story, right? Either you've seen the old version of the Ten Commandments or you've seen, um, what's that kid's movie? Uh, I can't think of it right now. It doesn't matter. It was one of those movies, but it was, it was interesting. Uh, Egyptian, I don't know the name of that movie. Does it, it doesn't matter. The story goes, there were, the children of Israel were in bondage over 430 years. 430 years they were in slavery in Egypt. 430 years they were building pyramids without the proper resources. 430 years they did not have equal treatment. 430 years there were overseers and they were being beaten. And if that wasn't enough of those 430 years of slavery in Exodus 1, we see a new Pharaoh who has no recollection of Joseph and the promise and what Joseph did for that country. And he literally says he's fearful of the, of the Israelites growing and taking advantage of them. In chapter 1, verse 9, he actually says to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply. And in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. See, this Pharaoh was driven by fear, and this demonic mindset is where he institutes genocide, genocide via infanticide. He sent out this edict declaring that we must kill all the infant Hebrew boys. See, he figured 
in order to get rid of a specific demographic, he needed to attack our children. There are a lot of things that our children are exposed to nowadays that are attacking their innocence. Now, this is horrible. This happens in the New Testament where King Herod does the same type of decree when he wants to kill everyone around, born around Jesus' age. We've seen it in the past where certain countries, in order to get rid of deformed children or to control a population, they're doing the same thing. See, we can identify those injustices because they are far. They seem distant. But there are cer certain ways and subtle ways that those ideals still reign today. When we see red zoning happening in the districts and the communities of, the ch of where these children live in, live in, that's a way to try to hinder a demographic. When we see in those same areas gentrification happening and the rebuilding of their communities are properties that their families cannot afford, this is another way of pushing out particular demographics. If you overpopulate particular school districts and then you underfund their education and you label them unable to learn at a particular age by the time they hit middle school, again, this is a way that we see a young demographic being driven out. If you see food deserts, you guys are probably, what are you saying, Chapel Hugh? If you see food deserts and these children are not able to eat fresh produce but all processed food, this is another way of trying to eradicate a particular demographic. And I could go on and on, but we'll just stop here just to highlight there is truly nothing new under the sun. And although the Bible shows us these bad negative things that can be parallel with what's happening now, the Bible also shows us how to eradicate these things. And so in the midst of this new Pharaoh wanting to get rid of the oppressed people that he's fearful of, the good news is God is already working. See, he has a plan that he's already built to have his plan go through a bicultural young man. And this young man's name is Moses. See, Moses is born a Hebrew boy, but he is raised as an Egyptian. Moses has a heart for his people, but he speaks the language of Pharaoh. Moses has access to the palace. So God is extremely strategic in using this young man who eventually becomes a murderer, labeled as an outcast, but he is used to set his people free. We see in chapter three of Exodus, this is where Moses actually receives his commission from the Lord. And then he is told to go give Pharaoh a simple message. Now this isn't in the Bible, but this is according to the gospel of Kevin Hart. Moses said, God told me to tell you. Now, for everybody that's laughing, they need to be worked on. They need to, we, we, God is still working on us. In fact, I even know that example. So y'all pray for your, for your country chapter. <laughs> Anyways, you are safe for real if you didn't laugh. Just, just let you know. But God told me to tell you, Pharaoh, to let my people go. And he says it with confidence. Yet Pharaoh isn't moved by that. He actually refuses to let the slaves go. But it's not until God uses and enacts the 10 plagues through Moses and to where Pharaoh feels, okay, you guys don't have to go home. Matter of fact, don't go back to the slums. Y'all need to go far, far away from him. And he relieves them and he allows them to go on their way. So anyone that looked at Moses because of the plagues knew that God's hand was upon him. There was no doubt. There's no way that a man could throw down a staff and it turns into a snake. When the magicians couldn't do that, everyone knew that Moses was being used by the Lord. What I would say is, when that 10th plague happened, because he wasn't moved, Pharaoh wasn't moved by the first nine, when that 10th plague happened, he had so much grief, and he decided to say, you guys go on much business, my children are dead, my, first son, my firstborn son has passed away, I don't need you in the land. So God uses this man to take on over a million people to travel into the wilderness 
to go to a, a land of milk and honey. And that's, that's the background. And that is where we land into verse 10. It's all peaceful. Everybody's happy with chapter 14 in the very beginning. But then verse 10 happens and all chaos begins to break loose. In verse 10, we see that Pharaoh has changed his mind. He must have met with some economic counselor and they must have reminded him that, hey, we cannot build this country on our own. We do not have the skill sets. We need those slaves back. And so what he does is say, you know what? You're right. And so he begins to chase the Hebrews. Now you have them on horses, you have them on chariots, and the Hebrew, the Hebrew people, the Israelites are on feet. And they're going. And guess what? Somebody is surprised. Because somebody looks back and someone says, I know, in my version, I know you did not bring me out here to die. They were looking at what they saw. They saw the chariots. They saw the horses. They saw a very upset king. And they knew that they were going to die. But they weren't blaming God. We live in a society when bad things happen, people blame the Lord. They were blaming Moses, the gentleman that said that he was called for this mission. And they were focused on what they see. But what I came here to remind you is of sometimes when we have all the opposition, when we have things coming against us, this is to set God up. See, he already had a plan. Ultimately, Jesus, God wanted to ensure that the pharaohs and the people of the other nations knew that he was the one and true God. The Egyptians served a false God. So if he lured them in, if he got them in a position, we have to now see and watch God work. And that's what they were saying. See, God, doesn't it remind you of when Peter was walking on water? You know, he was confident. He was, he was free. And then all of a sudden, he started to look at the winds and the waters, and he got distracted. Doesn't this remind us when God speaks to us privately about a particular path he wants us to take, even though it's not the path that your mentor has taken, it's a path that he has on you, but it seems like your leadership isn't listening to your ideas. It seems like your subordinates have lost their everlasting mind. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know that God is with you and God spoke to you. So my question for you is, is this an obstacle or is this a closed door? Do you keep going? Do you try to find a way around it or do you turn around? That's the question for you to keep in your mind as we go. I believe that Moses decided and he believed that this was just an obstacle and not a closed door. See, he did not turn and go a different direction. This was actually an opportunity for his faith to be strengthened and stretched. What is also true is that God can actually make a way and use obstacles or closed doors. It doesn't have to be either or. God knows that sometimes he has to shut things down so that we don't continue to try to go through that closed door. Have any of you ever experienced a closed door? Instead of being mad at God now, because if you look back, you can realize that that was a closed door. And if you decided to look back and reminisce and thank Jesus for pulling you through that closed door or moving you around that closed door, you can thank God that you didn't marry the wrong person. You can thank God that you didn't get a particular assignment. See, sometimes we can be stubborn and we want particular things, but God ultimately knows what's on the other side of that closed door and he doesn't allow us to walk through it because we'd probably be stubborn and try to knock it down. Yet God can also use the obstacles and the obstacles are there to help develop us. He can give you mountains, and the mountains are to teach you how to climb. He can place you in a place where you can't figure things out on your own, but it causes you to drop to your knees and be focused in prayer. He can place you around naysayers, 
not people that's cheering you along and encouraging you. And with that, it can help you with your patience. It can give you an opportunity to have an unbothered spirit and to always tap into what the Lord has said to you. What I would say to you, sometimes God places us in situations so that we can watch God work. And now you're asking yourself, chaplain, what is the difference between a closed door and an obstacle? How do we discern if it's a closed door and obstacle? You just said that God can use both. I think the answer to this question is to ask yourself, how did I get here? How did I get here? So a closed door usually happens when I place myself there. I'm not discerning. I'm not praying. I'm doing and manipulating and, 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 and making connections, but it's all on me. A lot of times when there's a, just an obstacle, you prayed yourself there. You fasted, you sought God's face before you made a mood, a move. The disappointment when it's a closed door, the disappointment that you're dealing with, it helps you to say, well, God, is this your will or are you testing me in my faith? So closed door, God, is this your will? An obstacle, are you testing me? Are you still wanting me to continue? Are you testing my faith? That trouble that you're having in your relationship, personal or at work, God, is this person a person I should be connected to? In a relationship, should I put them on the altar and pray and ask for you to change them? Or should I be shifting and putting my focus onto you? Should I be enjoying this life of singleness and allowing you to use me in that way? There are certain things that you can do when you're a single man or woman that you can't do when you're married. And there are certain things that as if you're in a partnership you can do that you can't do when you're single. So asking the Lord where you should be in those moments. Ask yourself, church, how did you get there? And if after you do a reevaluation and you reassess did I choose this or was I praying did the Holy Spirit move me here then you can determine if this is a closed door and you need to about face or if this is a position or an obstacle that you're to go through I would say that Moses realized that he did not choose this Moses did not go to the people and say, hey, I want to be your leader, and I'm going to set us free. Moses was an outcast, and God met him in a place of desperation. He was tending to his father-in-law's sheep, and God approached him and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation about a particular calling that he wanted to put on Moses' life. So the confidence happened because Moses knew that it was not his will or his desire. One of my colleagues would say it's confidence. He wasn't confident because he had the ability. He was confident because he knew that that was God's place and God's will for him. So I'd be honest with you, there are probably several challenges or red seas events that will come into our life. And we can say that we placed ourselves there. But there's also red seas and challenges that God placed us there. And if we're led by prayer and we have the confidence and we know that God led us there, this is an opportunity for our faith to be stretched. And then my question is, will you allow it to be stretched? See, Moses now has a group of people that he has to encourage because he's confident. He had that conversation with the Lord. And so he gives advice to these church people who are complaining, who want to go back to what they know. It's easy to go back to something that's comfortable, even if it's toxic for you. 
So Moses gives some wise advice to his followers. And it begins with, stand still. It says, stand still. Or some translation says, stand, for, stand firm. But let's talk about what that actually means. See, this phrase in Hebrew, yatsav, that literally means present yourself to God and let him go to work on it. Give it to the Lord and stand still. Kneel down and let God have his way. Because you're in danger, you have danger behind you and the unknown in front of you. What Moses was telling his people was to stand still and let God work. Ladies and gentlemen, they were scared, just like many of us are. But the word that the Lord had for Moses for his people were to stand still. And when you stand still and you give your heart to the Lord, you really don't have to worry. See, the reason why he knew that as well is because God had already had a conversation with Moses. God literally told Moses, do not trip when you see Pharaoh coming because I'm actually going to change his mind. So before he even got in the wilderness, the Lord, because of his grace, decided to have a conversation with Moses and say, hey, I'm going to change Pharaoh's mind. So as the people are worrying, as the people see Pharaoh coming, they thought Moses was wrong. They thought Moses was a liar. But when Moses saw the people coming, when he saw Pharaoh coming, he knew that God was there. He knew that God was telling the truth. You see the difference? Other people can see your circumstance and again, tell you how you should move, what you should move. But if you have a relationship with the Lord and he begins to talk to you, you know sometimes that when trouble comes, it was all God's plan. And it gives you an opportunity to tell everyone else, just like Moses did, watch God work. So they're in this position, and they're in the right position. Sometimes we're in positions that we're in the right position. But other times there's positions that I mentioned earlier that we place ourselves in. But God can still navigate those waters even if we're in the wrong position. He can make it an alternate route. Recalibrate like the GPS. But that's not the case in this story. But I just wanted to tell you all, if you're in a wrong position that you place yourself in, God doesn't turn his back. He can recalibrate you and get you back on the right path. The second piece of advice that we see that Moses gives his people is, he says, see the salvation of the Lord, for he will work on you today. And for the Egyptians who you see or you use today, you will never see again. The struggle, the opposition, the nagging person, the oppressor, God is saying you will never see that again. And God did not tell Moses in Exodus that he would part the Red Sea. God, it is so interesting that a lot of times he wants to see how much we trust him. He'll give us a little about how he wants us to move, but he doesn't tell us all the time the full story. So when he tells Abraham to go to a land that I will show you, he never told Abraham exactly where he would be. But he told him and he gave him the confidence and said, hey, I'm going to show you where to be. So Moses is told, hey, Pharaoh will come, but he's never told that you're going to get to the Red Sea and you're going to part it. So this was an opportunity for Moses again to stretch his, stretch his faith. He knew that God would have to make a way out of no way. He doesn't know what God will do. He doesn't know how God will do it, but he is telling the children, God's children, that if you put it all in the Lord's hand, God will make a way. We can't see it coming. We don't know the time, but we know if we present ourselves to the Lord, God will make a way. 
And then he gets there. And they're getting ready to cross the Red Sea. And the Lord says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the sons of Israel shall go through the midst of the sea and on dry land. God then in that very moment where his back is against the wall, gives him the direction in that period. See, a lot of us wants the Lord to give us direction early on. God, if you just tell me which way to go, I'll know it's you. God, I believe that you can do it, but just give me a little insight. But the fact that we have a personal relationship with the Lord, when we come up against obstacles, God began to download instructions in us in that very moment. And he tells them to go. I have not seen the waters part yet, but God told me to go. How am I going to go, Lord, when I see the water still in the way? This is where the faith has to be exercised. This is where you say, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I got to watch you work. And later in that passage, we see exactly. We see the Lord part the Red Sea. We see the staff hand over. And then we see the Lord in front of him, a pillar of fire. We see God guide them through the waters. And then when they get on the other side, the water falls on Pharaoh and the chariot. A lot of times, saints, we have to recognize that because there's favor upon our life, there's a such thing as collateral damage when somebody is trying to harm you. Because God has to realize in order for his glory, for his name to go forward, you have to make it. The system cannot hold you back. Mom and dad not being there cannot hold you back. Someone breaking your heart cannot hold you back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow you to go through this scary situation and then there's going to be some collateral damage. At the end of the day, the sole purpose of this was to show the other countries that God was the one supreme God. It had nothing to do with the Israelites. It had nothing to do with Pharaoh. It had everything to do to show that God is still in control. And with everything that we're faced with in this world, here and our families are faced with back at home, the one peace of mind that we have as believers is that God is still in control. That God will fight our back. That God will get the glory out of our lives. That it may be scary. That we may want to go back to what's comfortable. But God is by our side. God will walk with us. God will be with us. And God will ultimately remind you of the things that he spoke to you in the late night hours or while you're at work. These people getting on your nerves and then all of a sudden the Lord drops something in your spirit and reminds you to hush, reminds you to pray for that individual. And that's the hardest part but that is God. Saints, when you leave here today, all I'm asking you just for the next week is to say that God works. I'm going to watch God work. I know God is working. This hurts, but God is working. Family is tripping back home, but God is working. My spouse is sad and I can't help him, but God is working. My boss is not validating me, but God is working. My subordinate is having a hard time and is it a pact in my heart, but God is working. God is working.
Just watch God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, when the red seas of life brew, when Pharaoh is on our back, when we can hear the footsteps of our past telling us it was so much better when we were in these streets. It was so much better before I put on this ring. It was so much better when I was hiding in sin and didn't have accountability partner. Lord, when those things start to creep up, I pray that you place on your children's heart that you have called them out, that you have delivered them from sin, and that you will be walking with them. That this journey is not an easy journey, but that you're working. God, that you will never stop working. God, no matter where they are, you are in the midst. So, Lord, I pray right now that as your children leave this place, as they go with their wingmen, as they prepare for TDYs, as they prepare for a, a difficult week at work, Lord, that you remind them that you are still working in the back. That what they see is not the final answer. That you will make a way out of no way, just like you did for the Israelites, because they were your chosen people. And the people in this room are chosen and called by you. So, Lord, give them a peace of heart. Give them a peace of mind. Wrap your arms around them and remind them that you are worth. And we will forever give you the praise, the honor, and the glory just for working on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Thanks. I want to uh, 